Good afternoon, everyone. This is a follow-up to the last video where I talked about sunspots diminishing in count, which will usher in a cool period. A quick look at solar cycle 22, 23, and 24. You'll notice those are in a downtrend. When we take a look at the actual count of the sunspots, solar cycle 23, the last cycle, peaked out around 115. Our current cycle is peaking around 75. And the following cycle is predicted to be no more than 50, which is going to mimic exactly a period in history that we repeated once already in the early 1800s, which was solar cycle 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now notice this next picture here. The red line is our current cycle 22, 23, and 24, matching pretty nicely what had happened and occurred in the early 1800s. Taking a look further back, you notice that cycle 3, 4, 5, and 6 ran from around 1790 to 1820. When we go back further in time, that magic number of 50 is what we want to look for because that seems to usher in a cold era on our planet because of the amount of inactivity on our sun. Now these last two periods where they were cold, the Dalton minimum, the northern hemisphere temperature dropped about a degree Celsius, the modern minimum dropped about two degrees Celsius, and there were a lot of problems with crops, different types of food and fruit production because of the cold, the mold, and the blight that was around during that time. What this is, a schematic of temperatures in June of 2012, 13, and 14. We're looking directly down at the North Pole. If I was a giant, I would be looking at the Arctic Circle. You're going to find Greenland up at the 2 o'clock position. Notice the difference in the temperatures between June 2012. There was a lot of anomalous heating around 4 to 6 degrees above normal. And we jumped to 2014. All that heat is just gone. Where did it go? How did it cool so quickly? If you want to explain that, what we have to do is talk about the Rossby wave. It has to do with a high pressure oscillation over the Arctic Circle that drives cooler air further south in a deep wave. The high pressure, for some reason, is definitely related to sunspot counts. And when the sunspot count goes below 50, the high pressure takes over. It's called forcing, and it pushes the cooler air south in a different wave. We're going to repeat the same thing. That cold air is going to be pushed south in a sawtooth pattern, deep wave. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the satellite photo here. This is the United States in um, late September. You can see here from the satellite view, notice the, the pressure being pushed further south. That's an Arctic air intrusion. This slide shows it a little bit better. This is the water vapor content density, so you can see exactly where it's at. Look how far that pushed south, and that's what those waves are all about. Record cold temperatures in the middle of July in the United States. July. It should be in Memphis, Tennessee. It should be 90 degrees and humid, not 66 degrees. Let's take a look at the modern minimum. Now, there was a reconstruction of the temperature. And we can notice through that swath all the way through Canada, down through the United States, seemed to be some incredibly cold temperatures that stuck there, as well as over uh, Eurasia. We're talking about repeating patterns. Here we go. Throughout the winter of 2013 and 14, temperatures are far below normal in that exact same area. So I think we are starting to repeat that same pattern of cold temperature. April 2013, we could even go back an additional year. Record snowfall across the United States that lasted all the way through April and May. The Great Lakes in 2014 had the most ice since 1980 at 92% ice coverage. For April, late April, even into May, look how high above on the right side there in 2014 it is, has been even since 1980 when those records began. Let's forget a weekly coverage. All right, let's look at the entire season here. The light green line through the center is the 30-year median of ice coverage. Notice how far above that is as well as the duration extending out into June on the far right there. This did have an effect on the water temperatures. You notice in 2013 these readings are for the first couple days of October in 2013 as well as 2014. Notice the difference in temperatures how much lower the 2014 temperatures are at the surface. Now here's my my forecast. This year, the Great Lakes will be at 98 to 100% ice coverage. 
and that ice is going to extend into July this year because it will be thicker and it will form faster and at some point in the near future probably within the third year from now by 2017 and 18 in that winter that ice will stay around and it will have ice through the entire summer and it will not completely melt before the next refreeze comes this is exactly what happened in the modern minimum just a repeat of cycles nothing new just a repeat when we start to look for temperature records and you start hearing oh it broke the previous record don't just think about a break in the record notice the breaking point of the record and the actual number of degrees difference in the record this is Death Valley one of the warmest places on the planet for sure the hottest place in the United States this old temperature record was set at 104 degrees in 1945. The new record was 89 degrees. That was 15 degrees below. When we start looking at temperature records in Minnesota, we come into the 128 year cold. September 11th through September 20th, each red dot represents a new temperature cold record. And again, when we start looking, look for the numerical value of the difference of temperatures. It's not just breaking the record. It's about the value in Fahrenheit degrees or Celsius degrees below that last record. Now, Mount Rushmore was 25 degrees lower. And again, you'll start to see it's 25 degrees, 15 degrees, 16 degrees difference. That is a huge jump. That's not one or two degrees. That is 25 degrees lower. When we start thinking about cold temperatures, I, I think ice and snow right away when I think cold. So abundant snowfall would there be no, more snow of course there would so let's take a look at 2013 to 14 these are running at double and triple above normal value 231 percent 315 percent far above average for a, a majority of the north and northeast we'll start to see chicago detroit new york this area blanketed with heavy snows this year UK, let's jump over to Europe. UK, you are going to have a freezing cold winter along with Germany and the Scandinavian area. It's going to be brutally cold with incredibly high snowfall this year. No, Nothing's going to be impervious in the Northern Hemisphere. It's going to get cold, which will have an effect on natural gas prices as well. Can our modern infrastructure cope with the need for more heating? At some point, we're going to have a rollover where the infrastructure cannot cope with all the heating demand for the planet. Another event, this is in Russia, in Siberia. I know Siberia, we always think of cold, but this is Siberia in the middle of summer. July 13th, four inches of snow. Now, if you don't know exactly where the Ural Mountains are, here's a good map. Now, even in Siberia, it generally reaches 25 to 30 degrees during the summer. Next slide here shows, again, Eurasia coming into a cooler phase from 1980 to 1997. Five degrees below normal. That signals cooling. Okay, I think ice when I think cold. Let's look at the poles to see if they have any accumulation of ice because that would also signal some sort of cooling event. Notice the blue line, 2014, well above the low for 2012, which was the ultimate low. The ice is bouncing back. A different view for you. These are the last seven years. The orangish line at the very bottom is 2012. That was indeed the minimum ice formation. We've been rebounding every year since. Notice the black line, that's 2013. Red line's 2014. We're gaining ice in the northern hemisphere. Let's take a look down in Antarctica to see if anything mimics the same patterns. And, well, over the last 35 years of record keeping, it's the high point. An addition of 2 million square kilometers of new ice this year. That signals cooling as well. Again, I'm not into the doom and gloom. Our technology is really good these days, so I do believe there's many, many solutions to uh, solve these problems and get us through this next cold period. Here's my second solution. Scalable algae microfarms to grow spirulina for a protein source and a food source throughout a colder climate era. You can encapsulate these in plastic sheeted greenhouses that are themselves encapsulated in plastic sheeting, so you're giving a double layer of warmth uh, a lot of experimentation going on in the northwest United States up in Oregon with this type of technology and small growing areas with density and home harvesting and small communities working together. Again, 
This is not going to be a single thing where you're going to hoard food and survive. You are going to need to work together with the community in finding sustainable solutions that work to grow food in cooler climates. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new. In my next video, I'm going to talk about sea ice in nine different seas across the Northern Hemisphere. Look for that video. It'll be up in the next couple days.